And all God's people said? Yeah. You may be seated. Okay, so today we have a wonderful guest speaker who comes all the way from the nation of Kentucky. And she has come and joined us a part of this essential conference that we hosted here on Friday and Saturday. This conference impacted women across our denomination here in Foursquare and invited multiple churches to come and be filled uh, by what God is sharing. Pastor Natalie Runyon is an amazing, not only nationally uh, sought after speaker, but a worship leader in her background as well. Natalie, as I mentioned has seen the ins and the outs the good the bad and the ugly of church and has still said um, we're here we're going to choose to stay in fact her book raised to stay has put her on the map also we follow her on instagram i love what you write natalie about all these different uh, things that she says that really hit me when i'm reading them her second book uh, that has been coming out uh, the house that jesus built hasn't been released yet and it's already a bestseller on amazon to give you an idea of the the upcoming uh people excitement about what Natalie is sharing. So we're excited to host Pastor Natalie. Uh, she shared this past weekend at the conference. My wife, Kara, uh, whose birthday was yesterday, chose to spend her birthday at the conference because she loved what was being shared, not only from Pastor Natalie and the worship, but what was being ministered to. So that's how excited I am that I'm introducing Natalie to us as a church. So she brings in a fresh perspective, an awesome outfit, and a heart for Jesus. So put your hands together, give a warm Metro welcome. Pastor Natalie Runyon. Aloha, Hawaii. Come on. I am in Hawaii. This is my first time in Hawaii. And so I want to say thank you for making me part of your family. Um, I have been here since Sunday, which is why I have this rocking tan. Um, <laughs> I believe that I'm part of the island now, and so last night they gave me a crown of flowers to wear when I was preaching, and so now I'm going to tell everybody on the mainland that I will only come to their church if they give me a crown of flowers uh, when I'm preaching. So you've ruined me. Thank you for spoiling me. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Pastor Brandon. I, again, I understand as a pastor's kid the weight of inviting someone you've never met in person to, say, to stand at your pulpit. It's a huge weight and a huge responsibility. So thank you for trusting me. I love your people already. You guys have been such a gift and a light to me. A lot of people will ask what it's like to travel and to speak. And the truth is, is that I only do this because of you. I only do this because I get to hug you and I get to share in your life. And even if we only have this one conversation, we're woven into family now because that's just how the family of God is. Um, and so we may not see each other again until eternity, but that's the beauty of the kingdom of God is that goodbyes are never final. Right? And that is wonderful and that is beautiful. And so this is the best part of what I get to do is you, is, is getting to be part of what God is doing, not just in our nation, but across the globe. And so I've been in the UK in the last month. I spent two weeks in Ireland, Scotland, and in, um, in London. It was incredible. And so everywhere I go, I am falling even more deeply in love with God's church. And I have good news. The church gets some bad press in social media and when you turn on the news, but God's church is very much active and alive and God is doing a beautiful thing in his people, through his people in these last days to bring people into saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the best part is, is that he's asked us to partner with him in that. And so Raised Today is not... And, you know, a ministry that's bashing the church. It's not, uh, you know, all glamorizing deconstruction. I know we've seen these words, deconstruction and church hurt and church abuse. But rather, Raise This Day started in 2019 because I wanted to quit. I was in one of the hardest seasons of ministry of my life. And being a pastor's kid, that says a lot. I was 40 years old and I told the Lord, if it's okay, I'd like to quit now. Uh, 40 years feels like a good, holy and healthy number to tap out. So if I could just be a Starbucks barista... That would be awesome. And it was on that walk with the Lord that I wanted to quit that this phrase, raised to stay, sort of dropped into my spirit. And as I began to pray into that, he took me to John 15, talking about how we have been called to abide in him, that when we abide in him, not just stay in a church, but stay with Jesus, remain in him, he will remain with us. And as a product of that, we will produce good fruits. 
And so even when the church hurts us, even when people let us down, if we can stay committed to just holding on to Jesus, that even when the winds of deconstruction and hurt and all these things that come at us, like that tree planted by the water, we won't be able to be moved. And, and that's what I'm seeing when I look out at the church as a bunch of broken people who have somehow decided I'm not going to let the enemy have this fight. I'm not going to let him win. And if anything, I'm staying just to spite the enemy and give him a black eye. But what we're doing is we are creating this beautiful mosaic like a stained glass window. And when all of our brokenness collectively comes together like this morning and the power of the Holy Spirit shines through us, people will come far and wide to see the glory of God in his house. And so if you're broken this morning, good. We're all a little broken. We're all a little bruised. But God is doing something powerful through our brokenness because our God knows what to do with broken pieces. He multiplies them. And we have an opportunity to feed a multitude. And so as I'm here this morning, you know, I could go on and on and talk all about deconstruction and we could talk about church hurt and it would be a very intriguing conversation. And if you want to read more about that, it's in the book. Um, we have a few copies left here, but you can find it anywhere. And it is a conversation we need to have, but I have started to travel now and I want to start talking about revival. I want to start talking about rebuilding. I don't want to just wallow in the pieces of deconstruction. If we're going to tear something down throughout all of scripture, whenever God had people tear something down, there was always a rebuilding that followed. And deconstruction without any plan to rebuild is just destruction. And so deconstruction is not deconversion. We can deconstruct our faith and detangle from religion, but still keep our relationship with Jesus Christ intact. And so growing up in the church, being a pastor's kid, my dad was not like some third generation pastor. My dad was a drug addict and alcoholic in his teens, went into the army, got discharged for drugs, really had to fight for his, uh, you know, his whole life in the downtown area of Cincinnati, Ohio. He got saved in an alleyway while high as a kite one night. He opened his eyes and he told the Lord, if you're real, you're going to have to prove to me that you're real. And when he opened his eyes, the church across the street was having revival and the doors were open and he could hear him singing. And he walked in the back doors. They were singing, just as I am. And he went to the altar and he got saved that night and was completely redeemed from all addiction and all alcoholism. And from there, he started doing going out and he married my mom and they did evangelism explosion. If you don't know what that is, it was those little tracks that they would give people with butterflies that said, you're going to hell. And they would like pass those out. Like <laughs> the worst one was the one that looked like money that you could leave as a tip for your waitress. That was just cruel. So, you know, I think we've evolved <laughs> over time from that kind of Christian crazy. Um, but that's how we started. My dad would take us, my sister and my mom and I, and we would go to the soup kitchens and we would go to the parks. And every Sunday after church, we were at nursing homes, giving communion to the people who couldn't get to church. And this was a, a time in my life where he was teaching me that I needed to love God's people more than I loved a position in the church. That if I could learn to love the people, then when positions came and went, when churches came and went, that my love for the people would always keep me looking for church, looking for community because I loved the people. And he would take us to like the shut-ins, you know, the ladies that couldn't get out or widows who had lost their spouses. And I loved going to the older ladies' homes because they'd let me put their uh, all their jewelry on. They had those beautiful brooches. And my dad would be ministering, my mom, and I'd be in their bedroom putting on all their rouge and like making myself look good. And they had those blue cookie tins with cookies. And I would just sit and eat all the cookies out of the cookie tin. I always say my first church hurt was when I opened one of those that there were sewing supplies inside. It was like the ultimate betrayal when there were no cookies in there. But I fell in love with the people before I ever fell in love with being a worship pastor or being in any type of a title. And, and that has probably been what's kept me has been looking forward to seeing you. And when I found out I was coming to Hawaii, obviously I was excited to be part of a, of a state I've never been to and to be in the warmth when it's so nasty up in the mainland. But I was really excited to see you. And this morning, I, I want to dive into the book of Acts. And I love, as a Pentecostal preacher's kid, I love the book of Acts. I honestly think Pentecost Sunday should be a holiday. Like, I think we should have parties with cupcakes with flames on them. And I think we should celebrate all the time. But the, the book of Acts is just this beautiful picture of the church coming alive right before our very eyes through Luke's encounter. And 
we could talk, like I said, about deconstruction, but I want to talk about what it's going to look like for us as the church to begin to rebuild. And in order for us to rebuild with Jesus, we are going to have to be willing to be radically interrupted for kingdom purpose. That means that we can't keep looking inward and looking at all of our wounds and using all of our hurt and our offense and our past to be an excuse for not getting on mission with Jesus. What is that mission? That mission is the Great Commission. Going and making disciples. That mission is right outside of these doors. We don't have to get on a plane to get to that mission. And so when we can stop looking inward all the time and start looking outward with the eyes and ears of Jesus and we're willing to be interrupted in our day-to-day -day lives, anything can happen. And I believe in these last days, the Lord is asking us as the radical remnant, that word radical, the root word of radical is actually root. When you are radical about something, it means you're so rooted and established in it that you cannot be swayed any other way. And I do believe that this church, we have to be so rooted and established as the radical remnant in who we are in Christ, that even on our way to the grocery store, even on our way to school, even on our way to our next church service, that our eyes are always scanning for someone who needs the message of Jesus Christ. That is when Jesus is going to come back is when every ear has heard the gospel and we have to get on mission, honestly, so we can just get out of here, right? So if everybody could just start telling people about Jesus, then we don't have to stay here any longer than we need to be here. But until then, we're here and we are on mission with Jesus. We read earlier that scripture um, with our, our sweet new pastor, congratulations. Um, we read that scripture in Acts 16, and I want to read it again and just dive right in to the scripture. Now, a lot of us like Acts 16 because we're familiar with the story of Paul and Silas. Again, a really Pentecostal passage to preach when we're talking about praising our chains off, right? Now, here's the deal about Pentecostal worship. When I was started leading worship, I wouldn't always lead worship in Pentecostal churches, and they would say things like, Natalie, when you lead worship, could you not be crazy. Like our people don't really know what to do with all that jumping and yelling and, you know, and definitely don't speak in tongues. Like, you know, they're giving me all. And I'm like, of course, like I want to honor the house. You just tell me. I went to Haiti with these same people and we're laying in our hut. It's midnight. And all of a sudden outside of our window, we start hearing the voodoo drums of the witch doctors in the mountains. And I'm like, oh, it's on. Like we are in the, we are in the witchcraft city right here. I mean, this is like voodoo. It's all in. And I'm laying there and all of a sudden the ones who are telling me not to worship the way that I worship, they're like, Natalie. And I'm like, yeah. They're like, would you please pray? And I was like, okay. And I'm like, Lord. And I'm thinking they don't want my crazy. So I'm just gonna, I'm like, Lord, just protect us. Put your hedge of protection. I'm saying all the things. Like said, no, pray like you always pray. And I'm like, oh, now you want my tongues. Now you want my worship. <laughs> my point is people know who to go to when they need breakthrough. And so we're going to talk about that. But I want to first go back to those scriptures a little bit before that. And we're going to read this again in Acts 16, 16 through 18. Luke writes, one day as we were going down to a place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and he said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her and instantly it left her. Now, here's why I love the book of Acts, other than I really love Pentecost Sunday. The, the book of Acts is written by Luke, and it follows the disciples after Jesus has been crucified and he has been resurrected. We are beginning to go from this kingdom conversation to now the conversation of an organization called the church. And in Acts, that church is born right before the eyes of those disciples. And from there, they would collect people like the Apostle Paul, Aquila and Priscilla, Lydia. They would start to take on on this new organization called the church that you and I now get to be part of. When we look in the book of Acts, we see Peter in the beginning of his missionary journey, and then we go at the end of the book with Paul up until he is martyred. Now, in the scriptures just before these guys encounter this young girl, Paul, Luke, Timothy, and Silas, they find themselves at the house of Lydia, a woman known to be a merchant of expensive purple cloth. Lydia was actually the very first convert 
that we see in the scriptures. Luke records in Acts 16, 15, that as she, Lydia, listened to us, that the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. She and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guest. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agree. Now you have to assume that the apostles are on a pretty big high right now, right? They have been given this mandate to go preach the gospel. They've been given this instruction by Jesus as he ascended before them, that they're to take the gospel to the far ends of the earth. And they're finally on this mission, going to these prayer meetings. They encounter a woman named Lydia. They tell her about Jesus, just like Jesus told them to do. And she says, Yes. Now, if you've ever led somebody to Jesus, you know this is like the ultimate experience, right? When you've led somebody to the Lord, you're like, I want to do this every day. I want to do it all day. My point is, if you're bored as a Christian, you're doing it wrong. Because when you start to tell people about Jesus, if you want to be addicted to something, that's the best thing to be addicted to because you can't stop once you start. So these guys, they leave the house of Lydia. They're like, did you see that? Oh my goodness, this actually works. This kingdom thing actually works. We told her not only did she get saved, but her whole household gets saved. And the scriptures tell us that they're moving on to the next prayer meeting. I am a product of revival culture. Revivals all the time. Every time the doors were open, I was in church. And so it was week to week. We are just getting service to service, prayer meeting to prayer meeting. And this is what's happening. These guys are going prayer meeting to prayer meeting, riding the spiritual high. But then Luke tells us of a radical interruption. He writes, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. Now, how many know in this room that you could be on your way to a baby shower? You could be on your way to a baseball game. You could be on your way to a doctor's appointment. Anything that you don't want to go to, and the traffic is fine. There's not any obstacles in the way. Your children are perfect angels. Your spouse is helping. I mean, everything is just working. But you try to get to church, and everybody acts like fools. Kids can't dress themselves. Husband can't find that thing that you've had in the same spot your entire marriage. You're in the van and kids are fighting and you're swinging and hitting people and you're like, everybody just be good. I've got to get out and lead worship. And you're losing your sanity and your salvation all on the same thing because Satan will always try to keep us from getting to a house that prays. Satan will do everything in his power. Maybe even this morning, like the normal Starbucks line you went through was like all backed up because there's a new barista, right? Or you get here and there's a marathon. There's a marathon. Who runs? First of all, who runs marathons? Who chooses that? We had to take the back roads to get here because there was a marathon, right? Satan will always try to stop a group of people who are trying to get to worship Jesus. He is not going to just get out of our way and let us do that. He will always try to attack a house that prays. And this is what happens. As they're on their way, this young slave girl begins to follow them. And she is possessed in three different ways. She's in bondage in three different ways. First, to the masters who own her. Second, to the demon that is clearly within her. And third, to her sin. And each and every single day, we are passing people who are enslaved to these same things. They are slaves to this world. They are slaves to the possession or the oppression of anxiety and fear and suicide. I mean, there's so many things that we are passing each and every day. And we just pass it. We don't discern it. We don't know anything. We just think, oh, that person, I feel sorry for that person. We just keep walking because we're always in such a hurry to get to the next thing. And my question is, when is the last time that our hearts have been grieved when we have seen someone in this kind of bondage? And when have we been willing to be radically interrupted or inconvenienced to actually stop and to look at somebody in the eye and to see them as a soul who is being tormented and needs to be set free. This is what happens is that Paul locks eyes with this girl and it says in the scriptures that he immediately becomes grieved. Some translations say exasperated, some say frustrated, but what he wasn't was inconvenienced. When he locked eyes with this girl and he realized that he was talking to somebody, he was dealing with someone who was in bondage to these three things, rather than keep walking, he turns and he speaks to that demon within her and says, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it instantly left her. Now here's what's happening. 
Luke tells us that she's following Paul and Silas, and she's screaming at the top of their lungs, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. It's in this one sentence that we hear an evil spirit bearing witness to the truth of who God is. In other words, this evil spirit is echoing orthodox theology. That is terrifying in the flesh because what that tells us is that the enemy knows how to speak truth when it behooves him. Which is why we have to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves when we are out in this world so that we're able to discern when it's the enemy lying to us in of the form of something that looks good or sounds good or when we are actually in contact with the Holy Spirit and operating in the power that we have been given. And so Paul in this moment is having to discern what am I discerning? But here's the problem. Paul and Silas should have never been where they were. And this girl is following them, telling everybody who they are. They were Jewish men where they should not have been. What is the equivalent of that today? My dad used to Bible smuggle um, into China. And they would have to pack the suitcases with false bottoms, wrap them in birthday gift wrap as if they were taking birthday gifts, knowing that if they got stopped at customs at the Chinese border, they would immediately be arrested and probably killed. So when they got into China and they were posing as tourists and they were out seeing all of the sights by day and then going into the mountains and leading people to Jesus by night. Can you imagine if my dad was walking through the center square and somebody began to follow him and began to scream, this is Ron Thomas, he's an American, he's a Christian and he's come to tell you how to be saved. My dad would have been brought into jail and worse, probably killed. That's what's happening to Paul and Silas right now. This girl is giving away their identity and it would have made perfect sense for Paul and Silas to be like, we gotta get out of here. We can't stay here. Like, we can't stay here. If we stay here, we're going to get thrown in prison or worse, we're going to be killed. And it would have made sense for them to not allow that interruption to stop their day and just to get to the next town where they'd be safe. But it says that Paul was so grieved at the sight of seeing someone else in this kind of bondage that he turns and he speaks with the authority that he has and he tells that enemy that he can't stay there. Paul didn't have to Google how to cast out a demon. Paul didn't have to phone a friend and be like, listen, pastor, I got a demon here. I do not know what to do with this. Paul wasn't afraid. He knew based off of what he knew about Jesus from the disciples. He knew what he knew about Jesus based off what he knew about the scriptures to know that when he spoke to that evil spirit, that at the name of Jesus, it had to go. And so he activated that authority and he said, I command you in the name of Jesus to leave her and in Instantly, it left her. Spurgeon says that like his Lord, Paul would not allow the devil to testify concerning himself and his mission. We all have to become so angry at the right enemy that we will not allow the enemy to speak on our behalf. We will not give the enemy a voice in our ministries. We will not give him a voice in our families. And when he comes and he attacks, we don't have to Google, how do I handle this? We say, devil, you don't belong in my house. You got to get out in the name of Jesus. You don't belong in my family. You got to get out in the name of Jesus. You don't belong in my child. You got to get out in the name of Jesus. And we speak with the authority that we have been given. Now, here's the deal. The masters are now mad. Because the girl who was making them all of this money has now been set free. She's no longer under their control, no longer under that oppression. And so they grab Paul and Silas and they drag them into the square. And they say, this whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. And because Paul and Silas were Jewish, they were immediately taken, beaten, and thrown into jail with a guard to keep watch over them. Now... This may have shocked some people. If this would have happened to anybody else, they may have been like, we didn't know, we didn't see this coming. But Jesus had been training the disciples from day one. That the very thing that would probably put him on a cross would most likely put them on a cross. And as I was spending time in Matthew, I love how gentle Jesus is and how prophetic he was to speak over the disciples and say, listen, if you choose to pick up your cross and follow me, It's going to get hard. 
And this is what he writes in Matthew 10. I don't have this scripture because I just found this the other day, but I want to share this really quick. In Matthew 10, verse 16, this is what he tells his disciples. Matthew 10, verse 16. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. And here's what he tells them. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, not if... <laughs> When they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. There it is. There's that promise of the Holy Spirit that we see in Acts. You will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So Paul and Silas, they find themselves prophetically in this place that Jesus had warned the disciples that they were going to be in, drug into a city square, brought before authorities, put into prison, probably left to die. And it would have made sense for Paul and Silas to start to sing songs of lament. Oh God, why is everybody so mean to the Christians? Why do all the bad things happen to us? Why is everybody so hateful? Like, why can't we all just get along? They could have been trying to barter. Like, if you let us out of here, we'll never come back. I mean, anything that we do as Christians just to try to get out of hard situations, right? Whatever I got to say to get out of it. But it says that Paul and Silas started to sing songs of praise, that they began to worship in their prison. They began to worship. They began to sing songs. And as that happened, the scriptures tell us that there came a great earthquake that began to shake the prison and the chains of every prisoner fell off. But this wasn't the kind of earthquake that would trap everyone. In fact, it was the kind of earthquake that would open up the doors and fling open the doors so that everyone could escape. And as the jailer opens his eyes and he sees that all of the chains have been broken off, all of the prisoners, he knows he's in trouble because he's thinking these guys are going to get out of here. And so he takes his sword and the scripture says that he takes his sword to draw it up to his throat to kill himself. And Paul screams, out. Stop. Don't kill yourself. We're all still here. Why is that important? Acts 1, 12 through 14. We see the disciples, not Paul, but the disciples in the upper room. They decide in that scripture, the scripture says that they decided that they were in this for good. That no matter what happened, that they were not going to give up, that they were going to stay in position, knowing that the very thing that killed their leader would most likely kill them. The very first church was established on a commitment as a community that no matter how hard it got, they were not going to quit. So Paul, hearing all of this from the disciples, knowing about their leader, knowing about Jesus, he screams to the jailer, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all still here. Let them be an example to us that as Christians, we have got to stop trying to get out of difficult situations because God wants to reveal his power in us and through us, even in our midnight hour. Your Midnight hour is not to punish you. It is to make God's name known, to bring power into the darkness. And I know it's hard. I know you want to get out, but it is the only way that God can use us sometimes is by our testimony of how he broke the chains off so that other people can begin to see this wonder working God that we speak of. They didn't get out because it was hard. They stayed in position. They stayed in position, even knowing that it could have been their death to the point that when the jailer realized that Paul and Silas weren't going to try and run away, he looked at them and he said, what do I have to do to be saved? How do I know who you know? And there is a world that is looking at you and they're watching how you handle the cancer diagnosis how you handle losing your job, how you handle losing your house, how you handle waiting for the prodigal to return. They know your story and they see this peace that passes all understanding on you. They see you coming into a house of worship every week and they're questioning, how do I, how do I get that peace? How do I know who they know? And they may never come through these doors asking that question because they're watching how you live your life out there. 
They're watching how you handle the prison. They're watching how you're handling your midnight hour because they want to know how you have that peace that passes all understanding that transcends any type of common sense in this world. And that is why we can't get up just because it's hard. We can't quit just because it's hard because we have people watching us that God has entrusted to us to make his name known. We think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't have a choice. They were thrown in the fire. But there was a fourth man in that fire who was going to make his name and power known. We have Daniel in the lion's den and Moses before the raging sea, Esther extending her scepter before the king, Jesus, who stayed on the cross scorning its guilt, scorning its shame for the joy set before him that though he could have called 10,000 angels down to reveal his true identity and be like, see, I told you I was who I said I was. He didn't. He remained in position knowing that the very thing that was going to be his crucifixion was just the beginning of a resurrection. What you think is your crucifixion right now is the beginning of a resurrection. Do not get up. Because what is coming three days later is going to reveal the true power of our God. And this world has to see it. It has to see it. We don't get to escape hard things just because we're Christians. In fact, because we're Christians, we will face hard things. But Jesus says, take heart. I have come to overcome the world. Satan doesn't win. When I look at the scriptures and I see all of this, you know, I I love Paul and Silas because they stayed, but they also did four things, both in the house of Lydia and in the house of the jailer that you and I can do in the church now. The house of Lydia was saved. Not only was the jailer saved, later in the scriptures we find out that it was the jailer and his entire household were saved and baptized. The first thing that they did is they delivered the word of God. But we have to know the word of God to speak the word of God. I said earlier, Paul didn't have to Google how to cast out a demon, right? When somebody comes to us and they tell us they're going through something, we shouldn't have to be like, hold on, let me Google a scripture about peace. Let me Google a scripture about, you know, love. Let me Google a scripture about comfort. We should be able to pull that word up out of our hearts and begin to quote scripture and prophesy scripture over people who are going through a hard time. We shouldn't have to look it up all the time. It should be so planted inside of us that when we open our mouths, the word of God is the first thing that comes out of us so that we're not for a loss of words when people are looking for hope. To be able to look at someone and say, you know what? I know you've been having a hard time sleeping at night, but I'm going to pray that tonight you lay down and that you will know that the Lord sustains you, that you don't have to fear the tens of thousands drawn up on every side because you're going to wake up because God's mercies are new every day. We need to be able to just quote that scripture right off the tip of our tongue. That is what Paul and Silas did. They began to quote the word of God. They began to bring out the scriptures. They knew how to look at the enemy and tell him where he could go. Second thing that they did is they served. Never underestimate the power of serving the church. Never, est- never underestimate the power of taking a meal to somebody out on the street. Never underestimate paying for somebody's groceries at the grocery store. When we show up and we are the hands and feet of Jesus, people pay attention. It's so countercultural to be willing to be inconvenienced, to start the, you know, pay it forward line at Chick-fil-A when you're paying for everybody's meal behind you. I love being part of those. Don't be the breaker. Don't be the chain breaker. That's like the worst part. You got to keep paying that forward. Those are little things like that that just make people realize maybe I'm not alone. Maybe somebody sees me. The third thing they did is they baptized. You guys are going to be baptizing soon. Guess what? You don't have to be in a church service to baptize people. I used to swim in the baptistry. We had a baptistry in our church and I lived in the church parsonage. I'd go over and swim in it. I used to baptize my friends all the time. My dad was baptizing Chinese people up in the mountains in a bathtub, 300 Chinese people in a bathtub at 3 a.m. I was just in Florida not long ago and we were out on the water and it was packed. It was packed. This, we were, I was at a church and the, the pastor took us out on his boat and there were boats everywhere. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this old rickety fisherman's boat pull up onto the, the shore and these two really tan weathered men get out and, and I'm watching them and I can't really tell what they're doing, but I just noticed that they got out and they got about waist deep in the water and I see the one man holding the shoulders of the other man and he's talking to him and you could see all the boats kind of 
slow one down to, to look. And I told the pastor, I said, slow down. I want to see what's going to happen. And before I knew what I saw, the, the man placed his hand over the man's nose and then he dunked him under and he brought him up. And you didn't have to be a Christian on that water to feel the ripple effect of what was happening in the spirit. And all of the boats started to honk their horns and people started cheering. They didn't even know what they were seeing. They just knew it was holy. You know, and that man, he turned around and he realized that he had witnesses of what had just happened. And not only was heaven celebrating this death to new life, but now this whole people, group of people on these boats and he lifted his hands up over his head and both of the men just started cheering because some fisherman was willing to be inconvenienced in his afternoon on a Saturday to take his friend to the water and baptize him in the Gulf of Mexico. That is the radical interruption. And the fourth thing they did, they shared a meal. Church people, we're real good at this. You guys are very good at this. I've eaten more fruit on this trip than I have ever eaten in my life. And I am leaving here so full spiritually and physically. When you don't know what to do, invite somebody to your house for coffee. Make them the best breakfast they've ever had and ask them to tell you their story. And from there, you'll find out everything you need to know. Listening is a beautiful ministry. You have no idea just by sharing a meal what you'll find out about somebody. As we close up this morning, you know, I know it's not a typical raise to stay talk to talk about church hurt, but I'm so tired of wallowing around in old wounds. At some point, we have to ask ourselves what Jesus was asking throughout the scriptures. Do you even want to be healed? Do you want to step into the authority that you have or do you want to keep being a victim? Because we have not been called to be victims of Christ. We have been called to be overcomers in Christ. And the healing is for all of us. It's not just for some of us. Healing is for all of us. And I know some of us, we're sitting in a midnight hour right now and that's not your fault. Maybe it is. Maybe your decisions put you there. But sometimes life just happens. But God is good and he's faithful. He sits with us in those spaces. And part of being in a church community like you are is that you have people that are willing to sit with you in that dark space and not let you go to your chemo treatments alone, not let you walk through the death of a parent or a spouse alone. There are people in this church who are willing to sit with you in that midnight hour and you too will be given the opportunity to sit with people in their midnight hour. But we have to be willing to stop looking inward, start looking outward, seeing who God has placed in front of us, even when we're in our own chains. And as we are worshiping our chains off, show people what it looks like to stay and let God show his power in our lives. Let's all stand up together this morning. We're gonna close out here. You know, I, I realize in a group this size that there are people who probably do have some church hurt, probably do have even some church abuse in your life. You've been let down by a shepherd. You've been let down by people. And church disappointment is just as painful as anything. Trust me, I've lived it. But God is so good and he's so kind and he will restore what the enemy tries to steal. I also know that there's probably some of you in here and you're in that season of being in your own prison and you're like, man, I would just like somebody to sit with me in the prison for a little bit. Like, I feel like I've always been the one sitting with people. Now I'm walking this thing out and I just want to know I'm not alone. And coming here this morning reminded me that I'm not. And, and that's true. You're never alone. Don't let the enemy lie to you. None of us have been told we have to do this by ourselves. That is why the family of God is so beautiful. And so if, with every eye closed, if that's you this morning and you're like, I just want somebody to sit with me. I just, I just want to know that I have that power to sit in this hard space right now. I'm walking through a diagnosis. I'm walking through the loss of a spouse or a child or a parent. I, I've walked out some really difficult things and I just need to know somebody is with me. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If it's okay, keep those hands up. If you're standing next to somebody who has their hand up, would you just put your hand on their back? There's a couple standing up right there. There we go. Just put, just grab a, just put your hand on their back. We have one right here, one right here. Come on, don't be weird. Go do it. There you go. Got some over here. Just put their hand on your back. There's one back here. This is the family of God, right? If you can't be inconvenienced to move a chair, how are you going to end up going into the prisons? <laughs> you got to move a little bit. Find that hand. Yeah, there you go. It's outside of our comfort zones because guys, we are private people and I get it. But none of us have been called to do this by ourselves. 
So I'm going to pray uh, just a prayer of comfort and of team. We are a team. We are a family. And if you've been feeling like you've been orphaned or you've been left alone, I want to just remind you that your God will never leave you or forsake you. And your family, this church family, is here for you as well. You are in a safe house. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come together now as the family of God and we sit in the darkness with our brothers and sisters. I know it's hard. I know it's scary. I know it feels like the world is falling in around them, God, but you have promised that you never leave us and you never forsake us and you have given us a family. You've adopted us as your sons and daughters with a good inheritance, a a kingdom inheritance, God, that if you own the cattle on a thousand hills, what can't you give us, Father? You own everything. And so I pray that wherever there are needs that need to be met, God, that you would meet those according to your riches and glory. I pray where there needs to be healing, Lord, that you would come in and you would do the physical healing right now. We believe in healing. It's by faith we believe that we are healed in your name. Where there's mental healing and spiritual healing, God, I pray that you would bind up the wounds of of church hurt and disappointment, Lord, and you would replace it with that balm of Gilead that just heals every infliction, Father. I pray where there's marriages that need restored and relationships with our children that need restored, God, that you would bring everybody home, Lord, that you would just open up opportunities for counseling and conversation, God, where the enemy is trying to tear down families. God, we we ask for unity in the house, Father. And God, I pray for this house, Lord, that this would be a place where people can come and continue to find that hope that they're looking for, Lord, that you would strengthen the pastors, you would strengthen the staff, God, to be prepared for an end times outpouring of people that will come through these doors. What an honor and a privilege it is, Father, to partner with you in the midnight hour with your people. And it's in that mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you say thanks to Nellie for sharing with us this morning? As I had mentioned, uh, we're so grateful that Pastor Natalie uh, decided to stay with us even on Sunday as she administered Friday and Saturday. Now, what is it along the way that she had shared that impacted you? It could be about staying through difficult things. Maybe you're looking at taking an easy way out and saying, no, 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 like God has you here for a reason. Maybe it's your crucifixion is actually a resurrection. God is with you through these midnight hours or the, the fact that we need to care for one another, receive care, or reach out to others. could be many other things. Uh, the bottom line is this. Hey, we hope that you take what was shared today and you put it into your life and choose to walk that out. As we're done here today, um, Pastor Natalie will be outside in our foyer area. You can say hi to her. Um, and also, if you, we run out of these copies, grab one on Amazon. This is her first book called Raised to Stay. This is uh, her story about how we walk through different things in our churches and then how we actually come out better even through the tough stuff. Her second book will be available on Amazon as well. There's a special going on today that she said, hey, I want to just bless people with this copy. So um, if, we, if you're someone who's interested in her second book called um, The House That Jesus Built, you can search her name, Natalie Runyon, on Amazon. Um, you can pre-order that. And then if you show her that you pre-ordered, she's going to give you this copy. So two for one. You know what I mean? So check them out. Go check them out. Hey, um, that being said, whatever it is that God is putting on your heart, make sure that you're lifting it up to the Lord. Would you say amen to that? Hey, uh, let's sing Ho'onani as we finish for today, and we'll see you next week.